So last time we were talking about how when Khrushchev came to power there was some relaxing of, um, of treatment of countries in the Eastern Bloc. We saw Poland gain a little bit more autonomy, but we did see Hungary ultimately get crushed when it staged its uprisings. Now let's examine how um, relations with the U.S. change under Khrushchev's rule. So actually during the 1950s we see a little bit of an improvement between the relationship uh, with the U.S. and the USSR. Um, when Khrushchev rose to power he called for uh, peaceful coexistence with the West. So in other words, the idea that communism and capitalism could both exist so long as these two um, different uh, major influencing powers did not try to forcefully intervene with one another. Um, so this was, you know, very, very different from how Stalin uh, felt about, felt about, you know, the containment policy, for example, you know, basically the, if Stalin's idea was that he wanted to expand communism as much as possible, but now you see the idea is that these two, uh, these two different economic ideologies ultimately could exist at the same time. Now, why did Khrushchev argue for peaceful coexistence? Um, one of the reasons why was because he felt like the more important thing to focus on was improving the Soviet um, economy um, and not so much, you know, sort of military buildup anymore. Um, another really important accomplishment uh, during Khrushchev's rule is that Austria uh, becomes independent in 1955. So it was occupied after World War II, just like Germany was. It was occupied by the Allies. And um, what's significant is that the USSR basically agrees to let um, Austria become truly independent and neutral um, after it had been occupied for 10 years. So this is important because it causes some pretty significant reductions in Cold War tensions between 1955 and 57. You know, the, the real fear before Austria was independent was that Austria could basically be wooed by the East and, and you know, kind of fall under um, a communist influence. But when the USSR agreed to let Austria be neutral, this was kind of a huge, uh, huge improvement of relations, uh, relations between the East and the West. And then you have the Geneva summit, summit in July of 1955, and this is where the USSR meets with um, the US, Britain, and France. And the purpose of the summit was to um, make discussions about European security and also discussions about disarmament. So this is huge because just uh, in the previous video we were talking about how um, the Soviet Union just uh, you know, figured out how to launch a hydrogen bomb. Um, so now suddenly we see, oh, let's, let's talk about actually, you know, stopping our, nu our buildup of, of weapons. Um, now, there was no agreement reached at the Geneva Summit, so what's more important actually is just that the conversation took place, that there wasn't really a significant accomplishment. Then we start to see relations change a little bit. Um, the launching of Sputnik was a really, really important event in 1957. It was a Russian satellite sent into orbit on a rocket, and it was brought safely back into the USSR. So this was really unprecedented scientifically. This had never happened before, um, and it was really alarming to the United States because to them, it showed that the Russians were ahead of them, right? You know, they had superior space technology. Um, so this begins what's called the space race, um, it's a huge, huge emphasis on um, expanding science programs in the United States. There actually was significant um, investments in education for science and math programs in the U.S. after this. But basically the idea was for the U.S. to try to catch up technologically and with space exploration to Russia as fast as possible. And of course we see that this does happen in the 1960s with... Um, with various missions, including the moon landing, of course. Um, so this is just a really important moment, kind of eye-opening for the United States to realize that Russia, you know, is ahead of it in a way. So, you know, in a way it kind of, it, it brings back some of that tension. Um, then in 1958, uh, the USSR, um, demands uh, uh, that the allies who still were, were in Berlin at this point, even though um, even though now West Germany and East Germany were independent, right, um, and East Germany was still influenced by the Soviet Union, right, East Germany was communist, remember that Berlin itself was divided up into different zones as well. So Berlin, which is in the middle of East Germany, still has allies in it. So basically this is making Khrushchev really frustrated, and so he demands that the allies leave in 1958. 
Um, but after six months, he basically gives the Allies six months to leave, but then this deadline passes and nothing actually happens. So the ultimatum, you know, it's, it's just significant that you see that Khrushchev is still, you know, obviously upset with the Allies for still influencing Berlin, but at the same time, the fact that it doesn't happen also shows us that maybe Khrushchev is, is a little bit soft. Um, but then in 1960, we see um, an important event that really sours relationship, the relationship between the U.S. and the USSR, and that is the U-2 incident. So what happens here is that there's an American spy plane uh, that was flying over the USSR. So it was not legally flying there, right? These planes did not have permission to fly over USSR airspace. They were, it's flying incredibly high so as to not be detected. But ultimately, it was detected and the USSR shot it down. Um, the... The pilot actually did survive. He ejected himself from the plane. The pilot was taken prisoner. And then they found equipment in the plane. You know, basically, you know, they found the film. They found the camera uh, that was taking photos, you know, trying to observe um, things in the USSR, you know, that ultimately proved that it was a spy mission. But the U.S. at first maintained that it was just a research weather plane instead of a spy plane. And then when, when um, the USSR realizes, you know, after kind of salvaging the wreckage of the plane, that it was indeed a spy plane. Khrushchev uh, goes to President Eisenhower and demands that Eisenhower apologize for, the, for spying, but Eisenhower refuses to apologize. So Eisenhower is trying to take a hard line against Khrushchev. Um, now, what's important about the U-2 incident is because, you know, that sort of trust that Khrushchev had in the U.S., we talked about how for a little while there were improved relationships um, with peaceful coexistence. We see this kind of fall apart with the U-2 incident. That same year, there was supposed to be another uh, peace conference, so kind of like Geneva, but this one was going to take place in Paris. But it actually is canceled after the U-2 incident. So again, the U-2 incident just shows us some more souring with the relationships between the U.S. and the USSR. Uh, the Berlin Wall is another really significant mounting of tension. So even, you know, Berlin, even though uh, it had been divided, right, that, that part of Berlin was occupied by the West, part of Berlin was occupied by the East, um, up until 1961, there was nothing physically keeping these two regions separate. So you had two million East, uh, East Germans actually escape into West Berlin um, before the wall was put up. So basically this shows us, you know, first of all, that the East Germans were very dissatisfied with living under communist rule. And, you know, they basically decided to vote on foot, right? You know, they, they ultimately decided to escape and leave and go into the West. So this really frustrated the Soviets and East Germans who wanted to, you know, maintain this communist state and they wanted to maintain their, their population. So um, remember the uh, Berlin ultimatum that we just discussed. Now, this is three years afterwards, but Khrushchev, again, threatens to enforce um, that Berlin ultimatum again, right? He, again, demands that the Allies leave West Berlin. Um, Khrushchev says that he's going to sign a peace treaty with East Germany, and then, um, East, then uh, the Soviet Union would be able to control um, who got into Berlin, um, and who didn't, right? So it's important for us to realize that even though the war has been over for a little while now, there was no official treaty between East Berlin and the USSR. And so, you know, the possibility to have a peace treaty would be something that might really make East Germany happy. And East Germany might kind of grant concessions to the USSR and say, sure, you can control who actually comes into Berlin. So that would allow um, the USSR to basically stop allies from accessing Berlin. Um, you know, so... Uh, despite Khrushchev's demands for the Allies to leave, um, they don't, right? So U.S., Britain, and France stay in, stay in West Berlin, they refuse to leave. So instead of trying to enforce the ultimatum, instead the East Germans actually build a wall around West Berlin. Um, so again, this is sort of easier than enforcing the ultimatum. And the way that the wall actually works, we see this, we see the wall actually from the West here, um, and then we see just sort of a diagram of it. Um, there's this sort of patch of no man's land. This is actually an easier um, diagram to see. Um, there actually, first there's barbed wire. There, um, there's this, this is all kind of a, like a death strip or a no man's land, basically an area where there's these watchtowers, people can get shot. There's also a trench that prevents vehicles from crossing it. So basically the idea is to prevent any East Berliners from trying to get into West Berlin. Um, 
you know, and it's, uh, you know, uh, it was a very, very difficult barrier, although there were many people who actually did try to cross the wall, um, some of which were successful, but many others uh, ultimately were shot and killed trying to escape. So, uh, you know, basically you see that this, if anything, is going to, um, even though it ends the crisis about Berlin, of course, having this physical barrier between East and West is going to increase tensions between the East and the West, and it's also going to physically divide Germans from one another, just like we see in Korea. Um, there were actual families that were separated because of the Berlin Wall. And also, we're going to see that East Germany is going to, East Germany and East Berlin are going to deteriorate economically, while uh, West Berlin and West Germany were able to uh, westernize and, and catch up and develop a pretty strong economy. Um, then another source of tension we see is that Cuba, which is incredibly close to the United States, close to Florida, right, is going to become a communist country in 1959 under the leadership of Fidel Castro. So why does this matter? Um, well, first off, it kind of shows that the policy of containment is not working, right, because this country that is right on, so close to the United States ultimately is becoming communist, right? So President Eisenhower, who, who, um, is president at this point, decides to plan an invasion to try to stop um, Cuba from remaining communist. So there were some people in Cuba that did not like Castro, that did not like communism. They were these um, Cuban exiles, right, that kind of fled to the United States after Castro took over. And so what the U.S. does is it trains these Cuban exiles, um, and it um, then um, stages this invasion into this area of Cuba called the Bay of Pigs. Right? So in 1961, this Bay of Pigs invasion takes place, but even though it was planned by Eisenhower, Kennedy was actually president when it took place, but Kennedy didn't want to appear soft, and so he ultimately went through with it. But the Bay of Pigs invasion ends up failing. Um, so when it fails, Cuba wants to do something to try to protect itself. Uh, so since Cuba is actually a staunch ally of the Soviet Union, um, Cuba actually gets the Soviets to place missiles in Cuba to stop a future um, attack. But what's terrifying about this is now there are missiles in Cuba that could reach Washington DC, that could reach New York City, right? It was uh, really a scary time for the United States, right? Um, President Kennedy actually appeared on television and kind of explained to the American people what the threat was. So it was really terrifying. Um, for the Americans. It ultimately was the closest that the U.S. and USSR ever came to actually going to nuclear war. Um, so the Cuban Missile Crisis itself is uh, just a 14-day period in 1962, and it's where the U.S. demands that the Soviets remove um, the missiles from Cuba, right? And at first, Khrushchev says no, right? But the way that uh, the U.S. ultimately gets Khrushchev to give in is they place a blockade um, around Cuba. So basically, this blockade makes it so that no additional Soviet uh, ships can come to Cuba um, with, with, uh, with missiles, right? You know, basically, even though there were some missiles in Cuba, the Soviet Union actually planned to deliver more to Cuba, but this blockade prevented any further missiles from entering Cuba. So the blockade lasts for about two weeks, and after that two weeks, Khrushchev does agree to remove the missiles, but he needs to get something in exchange. And so what happens is uh, the U.S. actually had missiles itself in Turkey, which we know is also quite close to the USSR. So basically, you know, both of them agree. The U.S. is going to re um, remove its missiles from Turkey, which is so close to the USSR. The USSR is going to remove its missiles from Cuba, which is very close to the U.S. Um, and also the U.S. promises never to invade Cuba again. So the crisis is resolved. And in a way, what we see is this is very damaging to Khrushchev's reputation. He is seen as soft, you know, and this is basically going to uh, seriously contribute to Khrushchev's downfall, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, so actually, we, we just need a few more uh, points for this section of the reading, but we're almost at 15 minutes for this video, so we'll pick up with one more short video here.